Each year of Star Citizen's development, there's at least one ship that claims the crown of most anticipated. And before you, carving the canyons of Daymar is one such vessel. Welcome back designers, my name is Morphologist, and in this episode of An Architect Reviews, we're taking a look at the hotly anticipated Mercury Star Runner. I'll be taking you guys through its exterior as well as interior, highlighting its functions, program, successes, and failures. And if you guys stay tuned until the end, you'll discover that it has a few tricks up its sleeve, a few secret compartments that any self-respecting smuggler would be proud of. But you'll also discover by the end that there are a few major design flaws that will probably need to get a bit of a rework. Oh, and if you wanted a chance to win this ship, you can head on over to my Twitch channel and give me a follow to find out how you can win it live on one of my streaming days. And as always, if you think I did a good job by the end, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. So calm down and just fly casual if you see some Hurston security. I'm sure they're not going to find that hidden cargo hold. On Architect Reviews, I don't usually talk about the way a ship flies, but it seems that the Mercury Star Runner here is a bit of an exception because after getting my hands on the flight sticks, I discovered that this thing is far more nimble than it may first appear. At 54 meters long, it certainly is not a small vessel. That puts it quite a bit larger than a Freelancer, but despite this, it flies not quite like a fighter, but close enough to it that it feels like you can rely on it to pull some good maneuvers in between buildings, say here on Area 18. And despite being billed as a data runner, it packs a bit of a punch with six size threes on turrets. And even the pilot can get in on the fun because one of those turrets is slaved to the cockpit. But the stock modules for this ship are a bit underwhelming, so I'd recommend upgrading before you take this thing into combat. Shifting our focus now away from the function into the design though, a lot rests on the shoulders of the designers here with this particular ship because it's the first from Crusader, so it's going to establish a design language that hopefully later on can be reused for the backlog of other Crusader ships that have yet to make it into the game. Luckily, straight from the concept art, the Mercury Star Runner has been a fan favorite. Its asymmetrical design is particularly unique and it's what's made it very reminiscent of a certain other ship in another universe. Unfortunately though, it has seen a few changes from its original concept. One of the big ones being that the center mounted engine is missing, which in my view is one of the contributing factors to why I feel that maybe the rear feels a bit imbalanced in terms of mass to thruster ratio. And that's certainly also not helped by the fact that it's gotten taller and maybe just a, a little bit fatter. It looks like the designers tried to offset it by adding some more thrusters on the wings, but this too seems to be a bit too small for the exhaust port that they've designed around it. In the grand scheme of things though, this issue really isn't that big of a problem. Because at least in my opinion, the overall design of the ship is excellent and extremely well executed. I really like the white on black color scheme with red accents. It visually helps slim down its elevation. And I also really love how they establish a language of layering and contrast between very smooth complex form plates and a much more angular interior inner working. This layering strategy of design can be best seen here on the rear near the engines where the plates reveal that there's a much more complex engine component beneath. And you'll find that they're very consistent with this design language, this design strategy, when we step into the interior and examine its interior surface plating. All right, so I know many of you guys are chomping at the bit to get to the interior of this ship. How does it fare? Well, as you'll discover, there are some glaring design issues with its overall design, and we'll go over those momentarily. But the first thing I discovered on approach was just how tiny the access panel was. You could barely read open from afar, and unless you know what to look for, it's just a bit hard to find. I think this could be best resolved by maybe highlighting it with red around it, and then perhaps also making the UI just a bit bigger. The access ramp is well formed though, it's straight and that makes loading easy for vehicles. Initial impressions of the cargo bay are pretty good. It's spacious, plenty of room for fitting multiple vehicles in here, 
maybe three ROCs for doing a mining mission, and that's good news. The lighting strategy is also really nice, and the color for those lights is also very comfortable. I've always recommended going with a warmer color for lighting for interior spaces, and it looks like they've gone that direction for the Crusader design language. Just off the cargo bay, you'll find yourself, though, at the engineering door. Here you see it's very clearly labeled, which I think is great, it helps with wayfinding, and the panel is directly next to it, so there's no problems finding that either. We can argue here whether or not having engineering right in the cargo bay is a good idea, but at least it's got its own separate door as opposed to other ships like the Hammerhead. Once again though, the UI could use a little bit of help. Operating the button and stepping through the very unique door, we find ourselves in a very well-lit engineering space. And when I say well-lit, I don't mean that it's very bright in the space. I, in fact, am speaking about just how dramatic the lighting is, and I really like that it's consistent throughout the entire ship. Yes, it's a bit dark, but uh, like I said, it adds a bit of drama to the space that I, I think fits well with the science fiction universe. I also very much like how they've created enclosures for each and every item, except for, strangely enough, the shield generators which are just exposed on the wall. Perhaps they ran out of room? I'm not sure. I also really, really like how they're using the ribs or the structure to embed lights for a lot of the spaces here. You'll find this is consistent throughout the ship, but you'll also notice that there is something that I pointed out on the exterior happening now on the interior space. They're exposing a lot of the internals of the ship to contrast with the very smooth panels, like this wire coming down from outside of the, uh, the mechanical space. Now this, in the real world, would probably be a bit of a design oversight. You probably would want to cover this up, but for a video game, it looks really, really nice and adds maybe a bit of believability to the space. They've also got the possibility of turning lights on and off in individual spaces for the first time in a ship. Supposedly, this is going to become a standard function for all ships in Star Citizen when they get around to updating it. The button panels have also seen an introduction of uh, an additional suite of very cool features, such as the ability to lock the doors as well as turn sensors on and off for them. So you can lock them in an open or closed position by toggling that sensor button. This is going to come into play in the future when you have the ability to lock people out of certain spaces if they don't have security access. So say you have a first officer and captain designated on your ship. CIG's intention is to eventually make it so that you can limit who can access very sensitive rooms, say like a server room that has sensitive data, or maybe a, an intel room on a javelin where you don't want just a regular enlisted crewman just walking in. Moving forward in the ship, we'll have to travel up this small elevator at the corner of the cargo space to get to the rest of the ship. This unfortunately has a bit of a design issue in that there is nothing blocking you from walking underneath the elevator should it be in its up position, meaning that people in the future may accidentally be crushed by this thing if they don't know that it's not ready. So they should probably add some doors here just for safety reasons. Stepping out of the cargo bay, we find ourselves, though, in the server room. Now, this is one of the important features of the ship as it's built as a data runner, meaning it's supposed to transport data in the future, which is going to be a valuable commodity that you can trade and transport from place to place. And here we arrive at our first issue. Now, I don't claim to be a specialist in servers, but what I understand from them is that they are generally not directly accessible by normal people, and so anybody you have accessing your ship will be walking directly past what presumably contains very sensitive information. This not only presents a security risk, but also just a hazard. If you accidentally bump one of these wires, who knows what will happen? Well, this is a video game, though, and I understand that that's not really possible, but it does beg the question why they didn't put this in an entirely separate space, such as in the adjacent scanner room instead and just have the scanner at the end of the hallway. Stepping into the scanning room though, this is going to be an important space in the future when data running becomes an actual viable profession. This is where you're going to be intercepting, sending, or receiving information. We don't know yet what that's going to look like, so can't really say how well it's designed in terms of that, but I can say that it's exquisitely detailed and reminds me a little bit of like a, a seat from Star Wars maybe? Oh, I just said it. Oops. Don't, don't kill me, Disney. Just across from the scanners and servers, though, we'll find ourselves at the turret access. This is where you're going to be defending your ship against would-be pirates or maybe enemy factions. One of the things I appreciate about this design, though, is that instead of taking the remote turret approach as many other ships in SC have taken, this takes a much more direct approach by allowing you to physically access the turret 
in a much more visceral way. Because when you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to expose your very squishy human body to the vacuum of space and possible railgun fire. But there could be an argument made for the fact that you have a lot more situational awareness in a turret than you do in a remote turret because you can actually look around as opposed to being focused on a single direction when you're looking at a screen. You can also make a comparison to rowing your own gears with our cars. I mean, there's something to operating a six-speed today. People still like doing it, not because it's convenient, but because it's fun. And ultimately, this is a video game. It needs to be fun. Moving now more forward, though, towards the bridge, we find ourselves another hallway separated by a bulkhead. Here we'll find access straight forward to the actual bridge, but we'll also find access to the recreation area as well as living quarters. For workflow, this makes a lot of sense. It's good to have easy access to every part of the ship by having the living quarters in the center, but one of the things that really bothers me here is that there's an exposed gun rack directly in a major corridor. That means that any passengers on your ship could potentially grab a loaded weapon and go to town if it's somebody that maybe wants to turn on you. As a gun owner myself, it's always bothered me that this is the case for a lot of ships. I mean, except for Drake ships, they're dangerous and everybody knows that. But for ships like this, I would hope that they'd have a cover for them like what they've done on the 890 Jump. Stepping into the habitation area though, in terms of design, I find this to be one of the most successful habitation areas of any ship in the game. It's very comfortably sized, it's got ample storage not only in the walls, but in, well, placed shelves, and, and they've also got sensibly designed working areas for people who are maybe off duty and want to catch up on their well, communications perhaps from back home. Data running like hauling is probably going to be a more long term effort, so it makes sense to have something like that. The bunks themselves are not stacked on top of each other, so it's not really concerned here about saving space, but that makes the spaces themselves very, very comfortable. Each of the three crew members, including the captain, have their own little personal space, and that's good on a civilian vessel for people who may be not trained or used to working in small spaces with the same people for extended periods of time. The party trick of the room, though, probably is the head. You've got two of them facing one another, and they're hidden behind these really cool half-circle doors. The circular corridor is something that I really like, and obviously it's another design cue that's, uh, let's say, inspired by a really famous falcon. But every crew needs a bit of R&R, &R, and so recreation is also a feature of the program of the Mercury Star Runner. This is one of the first ships to introduce an actual playable game, by the way. That chest that you see in the middle? It actually works. When I was making this video the other day with the help of Armco community member Jimmy, uh, we actually played around while we were in Quantum getting from place to place. It was actually a pretty nice way to kill time. Brings me back to my high school chess team days, when I pretty much lost every single game I played. <laughs> Long haul users will also be relieved to know that the Mercury Star Runner also has its own galley, which means that you'll be able to replenish your hydration and energy whilst on the go. Personally, I really, really like the integration of all of the amenities into the design language, how they, again, added the lights into the struts. Everything, again, feels like it's very well put together and part of the same idea. And I also like how they're adding the Crusader logo into really funny places. At some point, somebody needs to count up how many Crusader logos are in this ship. I bet it's a lot. Let me know if you guys know in the comment section. But with that, we have just one last main place to visit on this ship before we go into the secrets that it has in store. And that's the bridge, which can be found down a very curiously long but empty hallway. Not sure why they decided to put nothing in there. There are definitely some stuff they could have added, but that's just the way it is, I guess. Now, to be honest, I really like this space quite a lot, and the very convoluted way that the chairs come up on rails to, to get to the consoles is actually pretty neat. I believe that was in the concept art for the ship, so they certainly delivered on that. Visibility through the canopy also makes the experience a pleasure. There are no struts blocking your view, unlike other competitors. <laughs> Looking at you, Connie. But one of the things that kind of disappointed me about the bridge was the fact that instead of having maybe a jump seat or an engineering station, they instead had another gun rack. I would have loved to see a place for friends to sit who are not piloting the ship. But there's more to this ship than what may first appear, because beneath the deck plating hides a bit of a secret. Turning to the cargo bay, you'll find that there's a secret hidden button that opens a wall panel to a whole little cargo area. This, of course, is the shielded cargo area for, you guessed it, smuggling. It wouldn't be much of an aspiring falcon of the millennium without it, would it? As smuggling is currently a thing in Star Citizen, I imagine quite a few people are going to be using this for shipping not-so-legal stuff from place to place. 
But there's another secret, and that's pretty much every single space that we visited in this ship is accessible through a secret vent system beneath the floors. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. This is pretty much a ship to play Among Us on at this point. But before you go and think that they copied that game, this was actually developed in an idea quite a bit before Among Us became popular this year. But it's still kind of a fun coincidence that this is a thing. I can already tell this is going to be a lot of fun for people to take their friends on who don't know about this ship, because they're going to get a hell of a scare. Oh, and you remember the recreation area? Yeah, there's a secret passage there too, but you'll never guess where it is. It's beneath the chess table. Clearly the devs had maybe a little bit too much fun with the Star Runner. But while the Star Runner could score high marks for its creativity, it absolutely fails when it comes to safety. You may have noticed that there are no escape pods. And worse, there's only one exit. That's the rear ramp. If for any reason the cargo bay becomes uninhabitable, say through a extreme fire from volatile cargo, or maybe the cargo ramp just breaks, the crew has no way to get off the ship. But in architectural terms, this wouldn't have even gotten past the inspection stage. In fact, the inspector would have probably dressed me down and started to question whether or not I was qualified to produce any drawings whatsoever, having completely ignored fire code. Honestly though, this is easily fixed. Even if there isn't the possibility of adding escape pods, just add some escape hatches, maybe in the crawl spaces underneath the floors, like a secret exit, or maybe an exit near the bridge. I think this would solve the egress issue, but honestly, it really is a big concern if in the future, there is such a thing as death of a spaceman as Chris Roberts has outlined. I can't be sure without seeing an interior and exterior model overlaid, but it does seem like there could be still some poche space or some dead space they could use to accomplish this. But again, this will be up to the CIG developers to evaluate. But aside from these glaring design issues that I've outlined at the latter part of this video, the Mercury Star Runner is a wonderful success for the design language of the new Crusader series, and I think it's quite the accomplishment by CIG. But of course, design is subjective, and I always invite you as a viewer to disagree with me. I by no means am an authority on design, and I don't try to pretend to be. In fact, one of the hallmarks I think of a good designer is to be humble and understand that you might not always have the best solution. That even the most junior of designers, no matter how long you've worked in a firm or worked in the field, can have the solution that you just didn't see because you were focusing too much on one aspect of the design. All I'm trying to accomplish with this video is to just bring a different perspective, and plus I really actually like making them. I enjoy design, and if I didn't, I wouldn't spend the enormous amount of time it takes me to actually put these together. But like I said, what do you guys think? Did you like the Mercury Star Runner? Did you agree with what I pointed out? Or did you see some stuff that I didn't see? I certainly didn't have enough time to go through every single detail of this ship. There were things that I had to leave out, sadly, because it's already nearly 20 minutes long. And don't forget, guys, if you are looking to win one of these for yourself, including a game package, you can follow me over on Twitch to find out how you can win one of these yourself. Thank you guys so much for watching. I've been Morphologist. I hope to see you next time.